Hello everyone, and welcome to Andrew Broussard Watercolors. Today, I am going to do a full watercolor video using two watercolor pigments. I had done a time lapse and posted it online, and some people had requested and said that they would like a full length version of that uh, two color palette. So, the palette today will be burnt umber, yeah, sorry, burnt umber and raw umber. Um, I'm going to be using, I think last time I used Da Vinci burnt umber and um, Da Vinci raw umber, but I'm out of Da Vinci burnt, so I'll be using Cotman and I will be using, let's see, the Da Vinci Raw. So um, I think with earth pigments, one thing that I had read, so I know people probably skip ahead to start the painting, but I just want to blab for a second. From what I had read when I first got into watercolors, when I was trying to select what brand I was going to get, um, looking up the different quality, etc. I had read that one of the things on handprint.com, and I'm not sure, hopefully I'm not misquoting, so I apologize if I am, that the pigments, the earth pigments within a brand may be geared around each other. Because the burnt umber, raw umber, the one is being heated up and processed to make the other, I believe. Same thing with raw sienna and burnt sienna. And they make their own formula and relationship between the two. Same pigment, but processed differently than different brands. I hope that's making sense, where they take into consideration how their other ones look whenever they're making it. That being said, I don't know how true that is. I really haven't played with that many different brands. Um, I'm a big fan of the Cotman and the Da Vinci brands. Great for uh, painting in this process. Great for, you know, just using a copious amount of paint and not really breaking the bank. All right, so let's jump into it. So I have a quarter sheet of Stonehenge Aqua, 100% cotton, 140 pound. Um, I just passed water over it while we had started the video. I'm going to start with my raw umber. And the reason I added raw umber to this experiment, initially my idea was um, it is going to be maybe cooler in value. It'll add a little bit more um, dimension to just a burnt umber painting. And we'll see like how it, how it just ships it. That was my thinking because the burnt umber itself holds really, really well on its own. Now, that being said, in the time lapse, when I was playing around with it, I felt that, and this is just a raw umber right now, and I'll talk about the process in a moment. I felt that the raw umber really shown using it as a dark and as a um in the kind of dry brush stage so if i wanted to accentuate shadows that's how i felt in the time lapse so we'll see where it goes with it today i think that it is an interesting combination i'd like uh to hear your thoughts down below now to talk about the process i'm going to make up an imaginary scene i'm going to take the tonalist approach um and I'm going to use the approach that is used by the oil painters, um, Stuart Davies, uh, Dennis Sheehan, and others, where a mixture of oil paint is thinned down and applied almost haphazardly, like very, I'm literally just stabbing it right now without even thinking, uh, just to create your scene and let it build up and wipe back and forth and build up and create texture. So I just kind of adopted that approach for watercolor. Um, there are a lot of watercolor painters that start off super wet and wet. How far they take the wet and wet stage um, seems to vary person to person. Uh, for example, um, 
Alan Owen will kind of partially pass a wet brush over his page. That's what it seems like. And then paints into that and get a variety of effects as he skips from wet to dry to wet to dry. While um, somebody like Stephen Cronin seems to completely saturate, will feed in a background effect and then dry off after that. And there's also Mind of Watercolor who, when he does his spontaneous video of paintings, I think he has, last time I checked, there was maybe seven of them up there. Really great uh, way to start a watercolor painting. Definitely check that out. He'll uh, feed paint in and let it swirl around and he'll have a lot of different colors and then dry and create the, the image. So anyway, so this, what I'm doing is literally just creating an imaginary scene. Um, you can reflect back on classical paintings and try to paint one from your imagination or pull aspects that kind of jump out at you from a classical um, a master painting. Or you could even use this to play around with them um, while actually looking at them. What I did was I fed my pigment in and so far I just kind of just blabbed. But now I'm going to use a paper towel to lift out some of my brightest areas. And when I do this, I'm pulling the water out and I'm now going to get a variety of texture if I was to go back over it. If I wanted to, I could feed water back into it by using the hake brush. I'm taking this up and creating a texture in the sky with the paper towel. Um, just be careful of stamping effects where you get the sh same textured shape over and over again. So wipe, swipe, change the shape of the paper towel, uh, have fun with the movement, be loose with it, and just play around. I use the same type of paper towel for oil painting. I find that it is really good. Um, it is the blue shop rag. You can get it in the automotive section of Walmart or probably any automotive store. And it's just more absorbent and for oils, uh, it just works great. Whenever we had uh, the toilet paper, paper towel shortage, if you went to the automotive section, you'd be able to find these towels there. Um, and when we, if you needed a mask or uh, gloves, the pharmacy would be sold out, but you just walk back to um, painting and automotive and you can find gloves and masks there. It's funny how uh, the different sections act like that. Now with this, I'm so just playing with my uh, raw umber now. I haven't gone any burnt umber yet. And with the paper towel, as I'm creating and building up my tonal values, and my textures, my shapes. I'm using the paper towel to just pull back. I could pull back completely, or I could pull back to kind of get highlight edges. And if I don't like it, I can come right back in like that. I'm not saying I didn't like that or not. I'm just trying to uh, just show you how we can go back and forth. It's a great additive and subtractive method. It lets you learn about uh, the moisture content of the paper. Because uh, I think a lot of people, well, first of all, <laughs> this is going to look like mud because we are using mud colors. But a lot of people are very timid with watercolors and they feel that the watercolors will go immediately to mud whenever they're starting out. I'll take the number one rigger and do some wet and wet structures. Trees and branches while I talk. So here's the thing. Burnt umber, and I'm using just raw umber right now, is fantastic for tonal studies. Um, it really helps you create a sense of depth and look for um, shapes and interests, uh, composition, etc. You don't have to worry about the color within a painting if you're just using your earth tone. 
from there, you don't have to worry about your colors getting muddy because you're already using mud. There's just so many benefits to working with um, either burnt umber or a two color palette like this or the other two colored mixtures where we get a neutral tone from it. So keep that amount. If you feel like you're struggling with color paintings, I'm not saying uh, move away from them, but try out some um, tonal studies and have fun with that. Another thing is, um, besides being timid with color or having difficulty with the color, there's often a reluctance, reluctance in thinking that watercolor is permanent. Obviously, it's not, and I can wipe back to the paper. There is a few different things that are permanent with watercolor, meaning that like in the process of painting, that's hard to kind of undo. If we were to scrape of any sort, that's often um, going to leave a physical scar on the paper. So it's hard to move back from that. Um, what else can do that? If you have oils and stuff on your hand, that can create a area of resist on the paper. Low quality paper will cause issues. So, um, so there's a few things like that, that do kind of, that you're, it's hard to erase or deal with, but for the most part, we can wipe back a lot if we wanted to. Um, that being said, there are some pigments that are more staining than others, so they might be a little bit harder to wipe back, but, um. With the burnt umber, there's really no, no difficulty. Or well, this is still just raw umber. In fact, let's switch the burnt umber now, just so we can see how this changes. It's a little warmer in value. I honestly, I don't use raw umber that much. I'll use just burnt umber. Most palettes will seem to have a raw sienna, burnt umber, and maybe a burnt sienna, where the four earth tones, or then getting into yellow ochre, those don't seem to be prevalent on uh, palettes. In fact, if you add more earth tones, it's more likely to be that light red oxide. But raw umber, I use it a lot in oil painting. It seems to help uh, set back and create a nice background. I think it's just because of that inherently cool uh, feel of it. Did a little dry brush over that area that we pulled up and then we'll darken around it. So anyway, so burnt umber is just a little warmer, a little bit redder. This area right here is all raw umber. Right above it is that burnt umber. So hopefully you can see that difference there. Almost uh, think of it as a olive, dark olive green. Okay, I think we have an interesting setup for it. Now, you could play a lot in this stage see how you could put textures in and how those textures will um, will dry, how uh, values will lighten. Uh, once again, feel free to go back in and pull out textures. Of course, you're welcome to follow along. Um, these paintings are kind of hard to follow along with. I I've never tried because I'm the, the one doing it. <laughs> um, I would think that there might be a little bit of difficulty following along, mainly because of how loose they are with the wet and wet. Um, so if you follow along, don't feel discouraged if it doesn't come out exactly the same. So we just have a lot of variables taking place.
and good quality paper will handle the wet and wet. And not all 100% cotton paper is created equal. There's some that, like I, I just use the Stonehenge now. It's just the brand that I'm all about. Um, I don't get any kickbacks from them or anything like that. I would love it. So if somebody from Stonehenge Aqua Legion is watching this, hey. Um, anyway, that being said, I don't have a, too much variety of paper anymore because going from one paper to another, it feels different. It's, um, it's a change for me. So I've learned how to use this paper and this is what I'm sticking with. We can use the card to scrape and like I said, this is going to be more permanent damage to the paper, but I want to plan out some, I'll probably do some mid ground trees on the dry off stage, but I'm going to have some big trees coming in the front. I'm scraping that now just to get an idea of how I want them to look. And create the scene. I don't think I want any highlighted trees here. I could use the I use the round edge to pull it out. Now I'm using the sharp edge. So I cut this card myself. I'm that talented. I'm just joking. Um, I cut this card from an old credit card. And you have a round edge to get better, thinner, thicker whites. Uh, the scraping edge will give whites or darks so a backfill. And then the flatter edge, you can pull out mounds. If you like the mounds, this technique. I mentioned Stephen Cornyn already. He's a prolific user of that. So is David Utcher and Joe Menza. They're all on YouTube. I find that when you push a rock, you'll create an area of pigment and if you move that pigment up over it, it helps it sit in place. It's not always the case, but it does help. I'm debating if I want something here. I think I'm going to do L-shaped composition. Where it'll be this big tree and we'll come across. All right, so I'm going to pause. We'll do a dry off, see if there's any um, drying shift that takes place. And then we'll move on to the next part. Right, so we did have some drying shift take place. Um, I was looking through the camera that I'm filming with while I was doing the dry off, um, looking at some aspects that I wanted to draw attention to. Here on the camera, it looks more splotchy than in person. That's a um, thicker application of raw umber during the wet and wet stage. I've found that uh, Payne's Gray will do something similar. So I'm not sure what the relationship is or why that would be splotchy like that. It might just be the quantity that I pulled up. Um, but I just wanted to draw your attention to that. The other thing is, here's a great example of burnt umber versus raw umber. Just that warmer red against the more um, greenish brown, if you want to say it. Okay, so... I haven't cleaned off the brush at all, and I really don't plan on doing it to clean it. So we're taking the hake now, and we're going to start creating our dry brush layer. And I don't want to paint precisely over what's behind it, because we don't, we really don't want to block out what's there. But if we do our dry brush, and we still see some of that softness, we create a sense of depth. Now, this painting, if it was to go underneath the mat, the mat would come to about here. I personally like to paint to the edges of the paper, 
just because it's helping me create the scene. The white of the paper is not throwing me off. And if I wanted to uh, mat it and adjust the mat, I can do that. I can kind of play around with my width. Excuse me. I hate when things are exactly the size of the mat opening as there's just no um, leeway for me. And some things come almost exactly to that mat opening size. And speaking of mats, I had created a video about a week and a half ago that I posted online about a website. Uh, no, no kickbacks or anything from them. If there ever is, I'll let you know. Um, but I had ordered, this is burnt umber now. Sorry, raw umber. Yeah, so it was um, Matboard HQ. I think it's just matboard.com and then it goes to Matboard HQ. And I had ordered a whole bunch of um, 5x7 outside of the mat with um, various cuts on the inside, customized. I ordered a lot of mats because as the price went up, or as the quantity went up, the price went down. So it was like really justifiable. Um, so if you're looking to display any of your artwork, I would recommend checking them out. I would also recommend messaging them and seeing if they have any um, coupon codes that's going on. Because I had bought, and I'll be completely transparent with you all, I had bought 800 mats front and back, which seems like a lot, and it is. But whenever I was looking at the pricing, to go from 50, sorry, 25 to 50 was a $6 difference. And I just figured it was worth it just to go for the larger quantity. But for all that, for the custom mats, and the backing and the bag, and uh, free shipping. So they had free shipping and I think they had 20% off. I spent little over $70, which isn't bad at all. If you were to go on Amazon and look for um, mats, especially oval cut mats in the small size for photographs, I could only find them in packs of one for about seven bucks. And I can't imagine what it charges at Hobby Lobby. Which, that's the thing that always gets me. If I um, sell a painting, I always try to mat it for the person. And um, I sell my paintings for cheap. If you look down below, I have an Etsy link. And if you ever want to support this channel, you can support it through Etsy or through um, the Patreon. But that being said, I always try to mat if I can um, do it for people. Because it's just so expensive getting something matted and framed. I know that they do customizing, but people pay twice the amount to get something framed and matted than they do for the artwork. Which is, um, I don't know, very strange. Okay, so we're building up the texture on the trees. Oh yeah, so so I encourage you all to to get mats, and it doesn't have to be from that website. Um, it could be anywhere. If you're going to display your works or give your work away, it makes it a lot easier um, for the person that's picking it up from you to to mat stuff up. Okay, so now I'm creating the texture of kind of the mid ground foreground. grab straight from the tube raw umber and show you how I'm going to use it to create the darker shadows. I 
think there's some sort of like art quote unquote rule about the warmth of shadows versus the warmth of the um, the light lighted areas. But I'm not sure what the rule is. I'm, I'm probably doing the exact opposite of what the rule is. This is just uh, that raw umber building up darker areas. Some front umber. Just trying to get the variety in that browns. Raw umber. Start choking off the side here, creating a um, framing type effect. I could have texture there, but I'm trying to uh, minimize the tonality, the variations in tone along the edge. That's kind of just a stylistic aspect that I enjoy. And I do it with the thought that your eye will focus in the real world on an object and then everything around it will start losing its sharpness and uh, tonality. And what I mean by that is look at the foreground of landscape painters of the 1800s. You'll see that there is a lot of detail in the foreground, but everything is very close in, um, in tone, so your eye doesn't get stuck there. At least I believe that's the purpose. And you may hear people say, don't uh, make your foreground too busy. And I believe that is what they're referring to. Let's do a pause and a dry off and see where we're at. All right, so uh, a few things. We are 27 minutes into the video, and knowing that I had started off um, talking and getting the paper and pigment ready, we're about 24 minutes in. You're gonna start almost inherently getting a, um, a time frame and what you feel like what's working for you. Um, my paintings and the videos are pretty quick, and I try to keep them relatively short and I know about between 20 to 30 minutes I can have a, a, a decent painting but I also know that at this point I can um, add little details and have fun with it and take the painting to kind of another level so I'm going to do that for this one so I'll probably go until 35 minutes of the video or maybe 40. We'll see how much changes. I'm playing with the number one rigger and I'm building up shapes and textures, building up branches. I'll probably scrape back and forth. There is one thing to add that whenever I talk to, um, to Joe Menza, I'll say, hey, here's today's work, here's today's experiment. Sometimes I'll be like, I feel like something's missing, or I'm thinking about this, or I'm not sure where to go with it. And Joe will often say, if you have to think about what needs to be done, then you're probably overworking the painting. I might be misquoting Joe, but um, he has a lot of great advice. So I haven't had a chance to watch any of his videos lately. I don't know if he kind of does a philosophical aspect in that regard. But he is a, um, a very wise man, really nice guy. So check out his channel if you haven't already. Call him the Bob Ross of uh, watercolors. He has very uh, similar hake brush paintings, but his are very colorful and mountainous. All right, grabbing the number four rig rigger. Excuse me. Grabbing some burnt umber. This brush holds more pigment and more water and just makes it uh, more convenient for me. There is no need to have a million different brushes, at least for this painting style. And if you really tried hard, you could probably do the whole thing with just a hake and a card. And sometimes um, challenging yourself like that and seeing what you can get out of the brush is fine. In fact, I encourage 
challenging yourself and experimenting so that you can see what you're capable of and you start learning about things. Oh, today's a special day. Um, it is one year since I had a thousand subscribers on YouTube. So that's uh, pretty cool. Burnt umber, raw umber. And I'm wanting to uh, build up the depth on that side. Now, you probably seen me pour out the raw umber, I don't know, about how many times now? Probably three times and filled it up. So the one thing with this approach is that you do use a large amount of pigment, but when you're buying Cotman brand, Van Gogh brand, um, Da Vinci brand, which this is, the, the price, it's a negligible. You're not wasting pigment at all. In fact, uh, when I was looking for what brands to get into, uh, when I was looking at that three years ago, one thing I remember somebody saying was, and this is probably a Ron Ranson quote as well, that the cheaper brands, and by cheaper brands, I don't mean like a $1 for a whole pack of 40 pigments, um, the cheaper brands like Van Gogh, the White Knights, the um, Da Vinci, by spending less money and not having spent $20 on a five milliliter tube of watercolor, you're more likely to be free and loose with it and learn a lot more. I had mentioned that I had an oil painting professor who would come over and scrape off parts of the painting, which felt devastating until you realized he was driving home the point that these are all practices. A lot of these are studies. Um, if you want to treat something as a finished work of art, that's fine and approach it like that. That's fine. But if you're doing that all the time, you might be hindering yourself in the experimentation process. So buy yourself uh, the cheaper brands, play around with them. And then when you run out of a tube of paint, post online and brag about it. Just building up that grass texture here. Let's do a quick pause and a dry off. All right, so we're 33 minutes in now. So I'll give us, I'll try to shoot for just three more minutes. I'm gonna grab some raw umber. I wanna try to build up that density in the foreground. Groupings of leaves, varying the density. I do like the way that scrape had turned out with that um, darker line alongside of it, giving that birch tree look effect. There's some people that just have that birch tree mastered. Um, I help moderate a Facebook page, Ron Ranson Disciples. And I don't remember who it was that it just posted just amazing birch trees. Also, if you follow along, you're more than welcome to send me um, or tag me in social media. I'd love to see your results. And you're more than welcome to uh, sign your name to the results and sell it. You have my express permission. Um, and if you want to support the channel, I have the Patreon link down below. But I also wanted to talk about the, the Ron Ransom page where, um, check it out. Uh, if you want to 
share your, your work if you paint in the style of uh, the hake brush or you want to learn we have a lot of great resources on there a lot of people that do painting tutorials i mentioned quite a few of them in this video and everybody's nice and polite we rarely um, i don't want to jinx us but we rarely have any of that internet drama on the page and we have all levels of painters on there And there's this one guy who, Ian Campbell, he doesn't film or anything like that, but I would love to see a film of his process. He has just been knocking these these pathways, these winter scenes um, out the park. Just absolutely gorgeous works. And even though we all essentially use the same palette and the same tools. You can see just the variety from person to person. Oh, um, one thing that I wanted to address, I think in the last video comment section, I forget who it was, but they had commented that they were watching me Joe Menza and Stephen Cronin, and that it, um, you know, I have my look, I have an approach. Joe has his kind of colorful Bob Ross approach, and Cronin has his approach. And that I think the person was maybe possibly overwhelmed. So, one thing I would recommend, because uh, this is conversations I've had with other artists that looking at multiple artists at once might throw you for a loop a little bit. So if you're, let's say, watching me and Joe's channel, uh, there might be kind of conflicting approaches. You can pick pieces from mine, pick pieces from Joe's, and make have your own style come together. Or, you know, hang out at Joe's channel for a month, and then when you feel like you absorb stuff from them, then go and check out Stephen Cronin for a month. Uh, check out Alan Owen for a month or a week and kind of just look at one person at a time if you ever feel overwhelmed. The number one rigger is great for little spindly branches and little details. And we'll do that. We'll sign the painting. We'll dry it off and we'll look at an eighth of that and we'll call it there. I mentioned at the 27, 24 minute mark that you'll start knowing when you get to the point where you're just doing little things like this. I know at about 35 minutes is where I kind of really get to this point. Those little pieces to tie together. And then if it gets to a point where I'm looking for things to do, looking for things to do, at that point, just uh, call it done, especially for just the fast and loose painting. Or if you're somebody that could put a painting on the side and come back to it later on, that's that's an approach too. I, I personally cannot come back to a watercolor painting. Oils, I can do it. Sketches, I can't do it. Like pen and ink work, I, I can't I can't set it aside, it has to be done that day and I, I I don't know why that is but that's just my personality I guess and you know you know yourself best so you'll find out what works for you um, let me dry it off all right so overall uh, pretty pleased with this um, in the comments below let me know what you think let me know what you want me to address. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, any palettes you'd like me to explore, any other videos that I've done that I really haven't tied things together with. Um, you know, just hit me up and let me know. There is our result. I hope you enjoyed. You all have a great day and take care.